Um, dear colleagues, this is Jordan Black speaking. Welcome to the fourth uh, International Medical Physics Week webinar organized by the IOMP School. Today, the topic is breast imaging and uh, its role beyond cancer diagnosis. We all know the, the great contribution of physicists to medicine, the discovery of X-rays, the discovery of radioactivity, uh, and first clinical applications. There are also the development of computer tomography and MRI would be impossible without physicists. What is not uh, widely known is that in 1965, a physicist from France, uh, from Strasbourg, Charles Gross developed the first unit dedicated to mammography. Uh, today, another great physicist, Ioannis Hopoulos, will give us an insight into the impact of new breast imaging techniques, how breast imaging has the potential to revolutionize breast cancer treatment, as Ioannis mentions uh, in his uh, abstract. It's also a pleasure to introduce the moderator, Professor Stoeva, Magdalena works in the University of Plov Plovdiv, Bulgaria, and uh, she's also, she also chairs the IOMP Medical Physics World Board. Magdalena, I will switch off my camera and uh, microphone. Please, the microphone is yours. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who has joined this session. I will not take much of your time. Just want to thank everybody for your support during this week. And, of course, to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Ioannis Sikopoulos. Smaller, faster, more advanced x-ray breast imaging and its role beyond cancer diagnostics. Very attractive presentation. Dr. Sikopoulos is the director of the Advanced X-ray Tomographic Imaging Laboratory of the Radiology, Nuclear Medicine and Anatomy in uh, the Medical Center and a scientific advisor of the Dutch Expert Center for Screening. Uh, his PhD is from the uh, Institute of Technology in Georgia, in Atlanta, United States. And he's performing research in the area of digital best breast tomosynthesis at the Emory University. Apart from these activities, Dr. Sikopoulos is or has been a member or a chair of two dozens of different of task groups uh, associated with the APM, EFOM, the RSNA, etc. And he's also a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Medical Physics and Radiology and associate editor of Physica Medica, the European Journal of Medical Physics. So, Ioannis, the stage is yours. Everybody who has any questions, feel free to send them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to um, share my screen. So allow me for one second. I hope now you can see my title slide. I'll take silence as a yes. Um, well, as I said, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar and uh, thank you to the leadership of IOMP for the invitation to present um, some of our work today. Uh, Dr. Professor Damilakis, uh, when he invited me to give this talk, he asked me to be a, a bit um, cutting edge um, and, and talking about some of the newest technology that um, we hope will be coming out in over the next few years that we we're working on as we speak. And uh, that's why I chose this topic about uh, the role of X-ray breast imaging 
the potential role of X-ray breast imaging uh, beyond cancer diagnosis, because it's a topic that is usually, um, you know, treatment of breast cancer is usually not really related normally to X-ray based imaging. And we think we need to change that um, for improving uh, the treatment of breast cancer patients. So I will just go ahead, first of all, um, I want to recognize that none of this is my work. Um, all of what I'm gonna show today is the work of these uh, amazing group of people. These are most of my PhD students and postdocs. Um, and the best thing I can do is try to stay out of their way for them to be able to generate this uh, very interesting and impactful science. And of course, these days, uh, we cannot work alone. We um, have the good fortune of working with a great group of clinicians, radiologists, um, like the ones listed here, Dr. Mann, Dr. Dorsey, Dr. Prokop, Dr. Smith, each in their uh, experts in their own specific sub uh, specialty in radiology. And of course, uh, many other breast radiologists, pathologists, oncologists, and surgeons who have inspired this work and are helping us guide uh, this work to be clinical impactful. Along with other scientists that are uh, agreed to collaborate with us and having worked with us, some of them for over 10 years, like Dr. James Nagy, a mathematician from my previous institution at Emory University, Dr. Longo from Trieste in Italy, and Dr. Kacharis from DKFZ in Germany. As you all know, science today takes uh, a lot of people and a lot of disciplines to be uh, cutting edge. And these are my disclosures, which are not relevant to today's work. Um, one thing I do want to say is I want to thank, again, IMP for this opportunity. Uh, usually, um, it doesn't happen very often that I can uh, not wear shoes while I'm presenting. This is actually the first time I, I'm able to do that. It does happen very often that I wear interesting socks. And these are, this is one of my favorite pairs, and they're, it's very relevant to my life. Um, so I, I will not show them to you uh, right now, but I just want to, I thought it was interesting that we, the, in these days, sometimes we have a little positive aspects of our new uh, lives. Um, okay, but to the project. So as you all know, uh, with breast cancer care, we can think of it as a, as a continuous chain of uh, stages. Uh, women are either uh, diagnosed with breast cancer as a result of screening, where we detect uh, cancers earlier, or because of clinical concerns. If at screening something is detected, they go to the hospital for diagnosis. Um, if imaging confirms that, uh, that suspicion, uh, women get a biopsy. If the biopsy is positive, of course, now they become breast cancer patients. The cancer needs to be staged. To, you know, to determine how large it is, is there nodal in involvement, is there more than one tumor in the same breast or even tumors in the other breast, and then depending on the answer to all those questions, it needs to be treated in one of several ways, and eventually, hopefully, the woman is cured and she goes back to some sort of screening, which might be the original one or specialized screening for surviving women. Um, and if we look at the imaging aspect of the breast cancer care chain, of course, screening is done with mammography or tomosynthesis these days, um, and it, it's the prime uh, technology used for screening. And diagnosis is, um, ultrasound has, of course, an important role along with mammography and tomosynthesis. Um, MRI has a role in staging, depending on the institution and the protocol and the country. Um, but treatment is one part where there's a very small right now role in, in terms of imaging. Once we decide what treatment uh, route the, the patient is going to undergo, she doesn't really receive much imaging uh, during therapy to guide that treatment. Uh, and most, and depending on the institution, she might get one MRI um, during the noadjuvant treatment or maybe one ultrasound but that's about it. The imaging doesn't have a clear uh, impactful role in treatment. Um, so what are the treatment options that women have when they uh, are diagnosed with breast cancer? Well, there's two options, either a radical mastectomy in which the entire breast tissue is removed 
or uh, breast conserving therapy, which means lumpectomy, in which only the area where the tumor is, and the tumor and, and the surrounding area is removed by surgery, followed by uh, radiotherapy to uh, kill off any remaining uh, tumor cells and to decrease the possibility of recurrence. Now, um, it's become more and more common when, for women to undergo this uh, treatment option of breast conserving therapy um, to before and uh, starting before getting lumpectomy to undergo some kind of Najvan treatment. So this could be chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, um, or some other type of um, drug um, related now in immunotherapy is becoming more common. Uh, the idea of Najvan treatment is to shrink the tumor, um, ideally make it uh, disappear completely under pathology. And when the woman responds well to the Najvan treatment, then the lumpectomy, then breast conserving therapy can become an option sometimes when it wasn't an option initially before Najvan treatment, or um, it becomes, um, a, no, breast conserving therapy will have a better outcome long-term if the Najvan treatment before the surgery and the radiotherapy was successful. Complete response to Najvan treatment, uh, pathologically confirmed, what we, what we call pathologically com com pathological complete response, uh, is, has been associated with an increased survival uh, rate in, in women um, undergoing breast conserving therapy. So we want, when women undergo Najvan treatment, to at the end of treatment uh, at surgery, that sample to be analyzed by pathology and for no more viable tumor cells to be found. That is the ideal case. Unfortunately, pathological complete response is only achieved in about 40% of neoadjuvant treatment cases. Uh, so the majority of times we do not get what we want and as I said, what is associated with uh, um, increased survival. And why is that? Well, we're not exactly sure yet of all the causes that makes uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, fail or not, not achieve the uh, uh, optimal outcome. But uh, one uh, of the reasons that we are becoming, is becoming more clear that now we know from the last few years is that tumors are actually very heterogeneous, which means we've all heard of HER2 positive tumors, ER negative, triple negative, all these different types of molecular profiles of tumors. Um, but those are um, let's call them summaries of the entire tumor. And what now we know that tumors can have small areas um, that are, have different profiles. They either have, uh, the, the tumor itself might be HER2 positive, but it might have some small areas that are uh, HER2 negative. And therefore, if we target them with a chemotherapeutic that um, is for uh, HER2 negative tumors, for example, then that other area doesn't respond. And, and these uh, groundbreaking papers by the group from uh, the Moffitt Cancer Center, um, they've come up with the idea of habitats. Tumor have habitats, have small areas that develop differently because of the microenvironment in the tumor leads them to be this way. And this uh, pathological, histopathological analysis of a tumor uh, section, you can see in blue uh, an area that is uh, more necrotic due to hypoxia, uh, an area that is um, more viable, still viable after um, uh, treatment. And this um, red marker, and you can see here that it's um, shown in violet. This is a, a marker for hypoxia. Um, and you can see it affects part of the tumor, but not the rest. And this is all under pathology. So this is what we consider truth. Now, before excision, this tumor was imaged with multiparametric MRI and analysis of the MRI um, has, can actually determine the same information from the tumor than we found from the histology and it is co-registered. You can see here, we compare the MRI findings to the histology, uh, things seem to match very well. And there are other studies and we've seen that imaging can be used um, to characterize uh, the biology and the molecular profile and the recurrence, for example, the recurrence risk of, of different tumors um, 
just from imaging features. Now, one issue, I, I want to go back for a second. One issue I should say that, um, of course, when we diagnose a tumor, we have a biopsy that gives us all this information about the sample that we biopsy. But when a tumor is biopsy, we get uh, only a few samples uh, throughout the tumor, but we cannot, it's impossible to do a histopathological analysis of the whole tumor uh, from biopsy because biopsy only samples a certain discrete number of places. So there's no way uh, using pathology to um, before surgery to actually uh, characterize every little portion of the tumor. So the answer for that needs to be imaging. Um, so as I was saying, using MRI and especially dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, we have uh, studies that show that we can find uh, imaging based um, features that predict uh, recurrence risk, in this case, 10 year likelihood of recurrence. Uh, we can predict pathological complete response to a certain high uh, degree of accuracy. Um, and we can actually predict responding tumors from non-responding tumors, again, using MRI uh, to some degree. But all, all this imaging, this is all based on, on dynamic and, and multi-parametric MRI, is limited to in, uh, the whole tumor analysis. So we're predicting response, uh, uh, final response outcome, um, possibility of recurrence and, and, and such items, but not characterizing the subtumoral habitats present in each tumor. And as uh, one of the scientists that has been uh, doing this uh, MRI-based analysis of tumors to find their um, characteristics and reactions to treatment, um, has said that you know we need higher temporal and spatial resolution imaging to be able to analyze the tumor in this ways, but down to the subtumoral level. So we can find and we can determine what exactly is in the tumor in terms of molecular profile, cell density, and even eventually genetic profile of the tumor, and therefore be able to treat every single little part of that tumor. Um, so this is a little bit of the clinical background. Uh, what I need to jump now is to uh, give an introduction to new medical imaging technology, or relatively new, this is um, about 10 years old, uh, which is dedicated breast uh, CT. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with this technology, I need to show you a few videos. Dedicated breast CT is a CT system that um, has been optimized for breast imaging. So the geometry, the physics, the medical imaging uh, physics um, let me see if this will start. Um, yeah, we go. So uh, this is a CT system that's been designed specifically for breast imaging. We have an x-ray tube and a flat panel detector that rotate um, around a vertical axis around the breast. It acquires 30 frames per second, a total of 300 frames around the 360 degrees um, to uh, um, eventually end up with a CT uh, image of the breast. This is what the system looks like, uh, the one installed in my uh, hospital. And you can see the bed. And if you open inside the system, you can see here, um, I know my pointer is a little bit small, but you can see on over here is a flat panel detector and somewhere in here is the x-ray system, and this is where the breast uh, pans through that hole. And you already saw this whole thing would rotate around the breast. And the 300 projections look something like this. They don't necessarily look anything interesting because of course these are the projections before reconstruction, but just to give you an idea. Um, and then once we reconstruct, we can cut, um, or I can show you the coronal uh, cuts through the breast going from the nipple towards the chest wall. And you can see the dark uh, tissue is the adipose fatty tissue. The wider uh, light gray tissue is the glandular tissue. And now we are at the chest wall. And um, if we do a 3D rotating uh, maximum intensity projection of that acquisition, this is what it looks like. You can see uh, very nice uh, detail even of the skin pores and the inside of the breast. 
um, I, I must say the radiologists usually look at um, the three views, the three orthogonal views of the breast CT like here on the left, um, rather than that rotating MIP. But you can see here very clearly a lesion that has a fat core and therefore this is uh, nothing, this is not a cancer that needs to be um, biopsied as opposed to a mammogram where you can see it's very hard to even see the lesion, let alone the inner detail of it. So this technology is clinical now. Is there, there are a few uh, commercial systems for the, uh, dedicated breast CT that are uh, approved for clinical work and there's a few installations around the world. Um, and, and we've been doing research on these systems uh, for, I, I would say, around 10 years. Um, this is another example of microclassifications, how they appear on the image on the right and the right slice of the breast CT. Um, as I said, we've been working with this technology for a few years. Uh, of course, this is cone beam CT, so it suffers from X-ray scatter being detected in the flat panel and uh, reducing the contrast and the accuracy of the images. Um, so one algorithm we proposed that requires a second set of projections but extremely low dose, less than 5% um, less than of extra dose by using a perforated plate in front of the x-ray beam before the, the breast, you get an array of pencil beams um, that uh, are detected and those at those locations, you only have primary non-scattered x-rays and from that, you can calculate the, the x-ray scatter in the real projection and the difference. Um, and when you take the difference, you end up with only a primary image. And we've shown that uh, doing this sort of scatter correction increases the quantitative accuracy of your imaging. This is a phantom with a few um, inserts. Uh, this is supposed to be adipose tissue. This is glandular tissue. And these are the supposed Hounsfield units of those two materials. And if we don't correct for scatter, this is the numbers that we get. And once we correct for scatter, you see our accuracy and our contrast is increased. There's a little bit of overcorrection uh, for the background, um, but okay, it's, it's still much more quantitatively correct. Um, we actually doing this type of scatter correction now on our, all our patient images. And you can see on the left, uh, the image without any scatter correction, it suffers from some cupping. Uh, you have a lighter gray in the surrounding um, outside of the breast, uh, the outer areas of the breast as opposed to the center, typical of x-ray scatter. Uh, the system has its own correction to flatten that image, but it, it's not specifically scatter correction. So you don't get the increasing um, quantitative accuracy that you get by doing this hardware and software-based combination. Um, one other development that we've introduced for um, dedicated breast CT is the idea of dual spectrum reconstruction. This is not the same as dual energy imaging. This uh, works differently um, in that one thing that happens in all of CT reconstruction is that um, filter back projection or any other current iterative reconstruction algorithm assumes that all the x-rays used to acquire um, the CT projections are all of the same energy. And this simplifies the reconstruction problem a lot, uh, significantly, making the mathematics a lot easier and, um, and, as, and allowing for um, much faster reconstruction. Now in breast imaging, in breast CT, the X-ray spectrum is a lot softer than in body CT. And therefore the beam hardening, the change of energy that's happening as the X-rays go through the breast is much um, higher, much more intense. And this results in a much higher inaccuracy when we're facing this assumption of X-ray being monochromatic in, in breast CT rather than body CT. So we wanted to avoid that. So we introduced this reconstruction algorithm that includes this forward model in which sit, we set up this equation of what is happening when we acquire these breast CT projections. And the key thing is that we decompose the breast into two base materials. And since this is a breast, the typical materials to, to decompose are glandular tissue and adipose tissue. So in essence, what we're reconstructing is not one breast image, but two breast images, uh, one representing where is their glandular tissue and one where is their adipose tissue.
so this model um, includes, well, the two images that we're trying to reconstruct to obtain, the geometry of the system that we know, the attenuation coefficients of the two base materials, adipose and glandular tissue, which of course we can, we also know, and the X-ray spectrum and the characteristics of the detector um, that, um, that's used in the breast CT system, which we, could, we also know we can model X-ray spectrum that is used by the system, which is, is something that looks like this. And of course, the left side of the equation is the actual breast CT projections in, in this form and in the sinograms that we actually acquire, the measured data. So we go through this reconstruction algorithm. The, the idea is to uh, invert this process and end up with these uh, two images, uh, W, which are represent, well, where is the breast uh, glandular tissue and where is the adipose tissue in the breast, and that is their reconstructed image. Then we then can combine those two images into one and show them to the radiologist just like a regular image. So the image, standard imaging process is something like this, right? We rotate the X-ray cells in the detector on the breast, we acquire the sinogram, um, and we end up with this image. But by including the X-ray spectrum in the reconstruction equation, now that means we can actually change it during the acquisition process and this reconstruction still works. So what I'm saying is as we spin around the breast and we acquire each projection, we actually switch from one spectrum to a different one and we acquire two sets, half sets of projections, one at low energy gives us better contrast. This sinogram, which is acquired with an X-ray spectrum that has in, essence, in overall lower energy has higher contrast, but it's noisier because lower energy spectra transmit through the breast uh, less. And this second spectrum that is higher energy on average, and therefore it uh, has less noise, but is suffers of lower contrast. Now we can input these two half sinograms into our reconstruction algorithm. Um, with the correct two spectra, uh, we just need to change this term, show two, include the two spectra, the, each one with a corresponding set of projections in the model, and we can still get a, a good image. And actually, the doing the mixing of the spectra in which we acquire half the projections with higher energy and half the projections with the regular energy gives us an image that has the same uh, image quality characteristics. Here you can see this is the original image with the original spectrum standard imaging. This is the one that is half and half and we have the same image quality but at about a 35% reduction in dose. Of course we can go the other way and improve the image quality and have the same dose but for this we were interested in decreasing the dose of breast CT. Um, this worked so nicely that we actually added this um, filter switching mechanism to the breast CT. And you can see this includes a copper filter and a standard aluminum filter. And it rotates at the speed so that each projection, remember this is uh, 30 projections a second, uh, is acquired by one of the two filtered spectra. Now one modification we could do to this reconstruction is add a third base material, which in this case is iodine, of course, who is a contrast agent. And then we can actually, instead of uh, reconstructing to two base materials, we reconstruct to three. And the third one is iodine. And we get a iodine only image um, without actually having to do subtraction of high energy reconstruction minus low energy reconstruction as it's usually done in dual energy imaging. Um, and you can see some uh, results and we can show that we have um, a decent, although we're not quite there, a quantitative um, uh, estimate of the actual iodine concentration in these added inserts in this um, breast phantom. Um, so, we, are, we have been working with um, regular three-dimensional breast CT to improve, uh, lower the dose and improve the image quality. Um, and one other thing that we've been doing is, well, now can we do more with these images than just show them to radiologists? 
And that's where the idea of radiomics comes in and more computer analysis as opposed to uh, only you know, human interpretation. Mm -hmm. So, of course, radiomics is, is nothing new. We're trying to analyze images quantitatively to figure out um, well, the answer to any question that we're, we're having. And we um, have done some work on radiomics for mass characterization to tell if a mass is benign or malignant. And this includes looking at its texture, its shape, its margin. Um, of course, we first need to automatically segment the lesion and that of course, these days we use a deep learning algorithm that, uh, that has been trained by manual uh, segmentation of these masses. And this is, uh, for example, the average of the radiologist's um, manual segmentation compared to the automated one. This is a relatively easy lesion. This one is a much harder lesion that still the deep learning based algorithm can um, segment totally automatically correct. Once these lesions are segmented, they can be analyzed and, and all these um, hundreds and hundreds of different features. Let me give you just one example of one of them. As you can see, benign masses on the left, uh, three examples of malignant masses on the right. If we look at the boundary at the edges of the lesion, um, malignant masses, of course, tend to have more irregular borders that um, can be quantified using something like the centroid uh, distance function, which once you turn it into the frequency domain, you can see uh, a clear difference in the frequency components of that um, edge descriptor. Um, so of course, radiomics is all about doing this uh, for hundreds and hundreds of different features. Um, in this case, we uh, have over 1200 features that were analyzed and from this, sort of data, we can actually tell apart uh, benign masses from malignant masses with an accuracy of 0 0.94. Um, of course, this um, today, this um, the next step of doing this is, of course, is with deep learning instead of, or in addition to this more learned um, um, feature set. And this is something that we're working on. But the benefit of, of this, the addition of these learned, um, well, handcrafted feature set is that you don't need as many, as large a, a data set as what you need with deep learning. And of course, when we're talking about breast CT, which is not in widespread use clinically around the world, our data sets are, are still quite small. Uh, so for now, uh, we see that this is uh, beneficial and we see that there's a space for the combination of traditional machine learning with deep learning, but eventually when data sets become large enough, then deep learning will probably do just as well or better than these handcrafted feature analysis. But all of this has been in preparation uh, for the next step. And um, what I want to show, what I want to say when I show this is, all of this is anatomical imaging, right? We're just looking for the right shape or the wrong shape in the breast. We're not really looking at how the tumor or the breast is working. What we need is functional imaging. We need to determine how the tumor is working, if it's dying, if it has a necrotic uh, area, or if it has um, different molecular or even eventually genetic profiles um, and using imaging to do that. Uh, so we want to move further beyond 3D breast CT to 4D breast CT. And that is dynamic perfusion dedicated breast CT, and in this case, continuous acquisition of uh, dynamic perfusion imaging, and therefore that's why we call it four-dimensional breast CT. So the idea is, of course, this includes injection of contrast, uh, iodinated contrast uh, to the woman, which is very safe and very common in the hospital. And then once um, the iodine, iodinated agent has been um, injected, we will scan uh, with our four-dimensional breast CT system for the truth is we still don't know and uh, how long we need to scan and there will be interesting biological information there, um, three to five minutes. Uh, technically speaking, we'll be able to scan up to five minutes and then we will decompose um, our projection and reconstruct the iodine only image. So if you look at the top right, we're going to be able to see the perfusion. That was the tumor. Uh, um, in which the iodine was coming in and then perfusing out. 
and then the rest of the um, render tissue washing in and out. And from that, we will analyze quantitatively each and every one of those voxels within the tumor and in the surroundings to be able to uh, relate that to the uh, different uh, molecular genetic and different uh, information in the tumor. Uh, so as I said, it's not only about showing this uh, four-dimensional movie to the, to the radiologist, but more about doing some um, image analysis to be able to extract uh, characteristics of the tumor automatically. Um, so the first step in building such a system is of course designing the hardware and optimizing the acquisition. And this is where um, a lot of software um, simulations have gone into. First, we needed a 4D software breast phantom uh, from which we use as a starting point, we actually used our 3D breast, patient breast images. Um, so these are just uh, patient breasts that we acquired um, in, in our hospital doing our research and in combination with uh, Dr. John Boone at UC Davis, he also provided his uh, research breast CT images and we developed this uh, segmentation algorithm to um, be able to uh, segment well, the skin, the glandular tissue, the vessels, and of course the remaining adipose tissue uh, in there. But this is this was, of course, it is at the spatial resolution of the breast CT. And if we're going to use these phantoms as representations of the continuous breast in the breast CT back in the simulator of the 4D breast CT, we need to increase the resolution of the of our phantoms. So we have to come up with an algorithm that takes the regular spatial resolution breast, breast phantoms to higher resolution. So we increase, in essence, the resolution of um, breast CT images. We don't, I'm not claiming that we improve the quality of breast CT images. We're creating phantoms. So we're actually inventing new data. We just, uh, that new data is based on realistic uh, breast features. And for that, of course, we use a deep learning algorithm that we trained um, with higher resolution images. And those higher resolution images were obtained from as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Longo, one of her collaborators from Trieste in Italy, where she has a synchrotron-based um, breast CT uh, system that with a spatial resolution with a box the size of, I believe, 64 um, microns. Um, so of course, we can downgrade the resolution of those real uh, well, sample, breast tissue sample images, and then train the network to do the, the opposite. Uh, so a few examples of how this network not only increases the, the resolution of the image, but also adds features that would be uh, lost in a lower resolution system. So we go from a standard resolution breast CT tissue um, examples to higher resolution and a few more examples of what different pieces of the phantom look like. But we're also interested in the temporal um, domain of the, of the blood, iodine blood circulating through the breast, so we had to add a 4D component to it. So we had to simulate, and this now becomes a four-dimensional software breast phantom, the um, ionated blood entering and washing out of the breast and entering and washing out of tumor models, either homogeneous tumor models like this one, or, um, well, first of all, more malignant-like uh, behaving tumors in which the uh, wash in is rapid and wash out is rapid, or more benign looking fan, uh, tumors in which wash in and wash out takes longer and is not that intense. And we have uh, some more uh, ability to simulate homogeneous uh, lesions and rim enhancement lesions. Uh, so overall, when we put all this together, we end up with this four dimensional software phantom in which uh, we have uh, a tumor that if it's malignant, it enhances highly quickly and enhances and washes out. And then the rest of the tissue, especially the, the normal glandular tissue enhances to some degree because of, uh, we know the background parenchyma enhancement effect and, and so forth. And we can change the input parameters of the fandom so that we can simulate any type of um, enhancement pattern. So we take this four dimensional phantom and we put it in, in, we created this 4D breast CT system simulator. And that 
And for that, we replicated what happens in the physics of a, of a RCT system, ray tracing for the primary X-rays uh, arriving at a detector, a scatter estimate, and the detector response. So of course, if you only do the ray tracing, you have a perfect image with no noise, no scatter, no detector effects. Um, we use a Monte Carlo simulation to estimate or predict what the scatter for such a breast would be. And we add it back, and so you get the typical cupping artifacts of a scatter. And then the detector response to the incoming x-ray, so you have a resolution loss and noise. So you end up with projections with all the effects of uh, a real breast system. And this is what a projection would look like, and you see the profile through this simulated tumor. So of course, all simulations have to be validated first. So we compared um, this simulation of a 4D system acquiring a, um, a single 3D image to what we could do with this 3D system that we have available. Um, and as you can see, uh, profiles look reasonable. As you increase the dose, you get um, lower noise image. Um, a more quantitative comparison, the signal to noise ratio in acquired images versus simulated images uh, matched nicely. Um, the Hounsford units of different lesions with different equivalent densities also match nicely between a real phantom, uh, really acquired image versus a completely simulated one. And even a phantom in which we added um, iodine to it with the four different concentrations, we can again simulate um, such uh, image uh, correctly. And then that's when we can then turn on, once it's validated, our simulations of 4D breast CT imaging. And now you can see a full sequence of data acquired from what would be a four-dimensional breast CT image. This is a, a simulated tumor in our breast, four-dimensional breast phantom. And if you um, acquire 300 seconds worth of data at very low dose, this is, um, approximately the, I mean, this is what two voxels, one in the tumor, one in the parenchyma give you. Of course, it's extremely noisy. If you increase the dose somewhat higher, um, you do get a little bit uh, less noise in your profiles. But again, this is uh, some examples of the signal that we get. This is the truth in the simulation over here to the left. And this is what the images really look like. And it might not look like much, but hold that thought because this is just the raw reconstruction that needs uh, many corrections. And we are working to develop these corrections. Uh, one of them is of course uh, motion correction and this is the two parts. O overall motion correction between reconstructions um, because if we are uh, doing imaging at very high resolutions for five minutes, you can imagine the breast will move and this needs to be corrected for. Um, and an, a key motion correction algorithm that uh, we had to develop in, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Dr. Kacheris in Germany is within uh, one projection set, within the 300 projections that we acquired during those uh, few seconds, if the tumor moves or the breast moves, what will happen? So we can simulated uh, a tumor moving up to two centimeters during one single acquisition. Uh, and with our motion correction algorithm, you can see that we can recover back the tumor uh, quite nicely as if it hadn't moved at all. Um, so this is a key, key component for our quantitative analysis. We also had to develop a noise reduction filter that would um, allow us to do this quantitative analysis of this uh, voxel um, in a reasonable way. And this is how, uh, what it can do. I'm looking at just a single voxel right now. This is a truth a true signal, uh, you can see it goes up and then it goes down and it's sampled at 30 time points. And if I add an immense number of, uh, an immense amount of noise, you can see the standard deviation of this and this signal I just added is uh, equivalent of 0.5. That's what it looks like. So say they have three voxels with three different um, truths behind them. And you can see uh, the difference between the two high, most different voxels have um, a max difference in signal of 0 0.6. And I'm adding a noise with a standard deviation of 0.5. So I really am at a very, very low signal to noise ratio environment, which is what we expect. 
Um, and now I created an image with approximately 500 voxels of each of these signals behind them. Of course, they all have this random degree of noise. And we use um, what we call a tissue similarity filter to uh, filter these uh, profiles. And this is what we get. I'm showing you here three voxels. This is the truth. The ones in dashed lines are the truth. And this is the real data after we filter it. And you can see how even though we had this as input, what came out was this. So you can see the power of this filter. And since we're imaging physicists, I'm going to show you um, uh, one slice of one time point of this simulated breast image, breast perfusion image. And you can see on the left is without the filter and on the right is with the filter. And the arrows are showing three vessels and the tumor itself. And so you can see how we can recover um, very high degree of signal. Um, and if we look at the performance of this filter, you can see on the same horizontal line, that means equal image quality right, in terms of noise. But as we go to the right, that means we need a lower dose to acquire the same image after filtering. So you can see from a uh, unfiltered image, we can uh, apply the filter and reduce the dose by a factor of four and end up with the same signal to noise ratio. So it's this, in part, is this filter that allows us to introduce this whole idea of uh, 4D breast CT and still be at a reasonable uh, dose. So uh, to summarize, we are um, in the process of building, uh, actually uh, over the next uh, year and a half, this uh, 4D breast CT system. We have done all the, uh, a lot of the software uh, simulation to design uh, the system. We, can, we will be able to acquire up to five minutes of a, uh, continuously with this dual spectrum acquisition um, format that we come up with. We calculate that we will need a mean glandular dose of 15 to 25 milligrays. Yes, that is considerably more than screening, but remember this is to, for already diagnosed patients that already have breast cancer that eventually will get radiotherapy, which, which is a thousand times more dose than this. Uh, we'll have a temporal resolution of about three seconds uh, with a voxel size of 70 microns. Uh, we will look at the quantitative iodine only images, uh, thanks to our spectral reconstruction with material decomposition after uh, and after scatter correction and motion correction and noise filtering like I showed you. The idea is to uh, relate, give this image over to an AI algorithm that has been trained based on histop histopathological truth. From that, we will be able to get details of the, at the subtumor level of uh, the tumor reality. As I said, the training will, will be done using uh, histopathology. It needs to be large section histopathology so we can have uh, spatial correspondence. And from that, we will learn the cellular density distribution in the tumors, the vascular axis differences in the tumor using an endothelial cell marker uh, and we believe we will be able to characterize the molecular profiles um, within uh, each individual portion of the tumor and eventually although this is not part of the current um, project is even the genetic characteristics of the tumor so for, with that, we'll be able to, we believe, improve staging and the detection of multifocal, multicentric disease. The most important part is we're going to be able to take into account the actual uh, presence of all the different types of uh, tumor in, inside one tumor to personalize neurodegenerative treatment, to do a continuous response monitoring to the treatment, predict final response, um, aid with surgery planning, and the pie in the sky is if we can assure that we achieve pathologically complete response, in essence, we don't really need to do surgery anymore because the tumor will have been disappeared completely only based on the neuroadjuvant treatment. Um, so once we achieve that and, and um, we show that in the clinic, we hope that then imaging will be kind of have a key par part on every stage of breast cancer care and especially as I described today, the four dimensional aspects of um, breast CT will have an impact on treatment. Um, so that's what I wanted to show today. 
And I should say that all this research has been funded by the National Cancer Institute of the US. And the next step is um, uh, starting to be funded by the European Research Council here in the European Union. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ioannis. Such a wonderful presentation. And uh, the audience here is very active, uh, commenting, uh, sending their feedback, which of course is very positive. Uh, we do have a large number of questions, of course, due to the interest of time. Uh, you shall be able to answer only a few of them. So let me start with the very first question that was posted. It came from Aaron Chugule from India. And the question is, is the CT for breast imaging commercially available? And if yes, the company manufacturing. To Aaron's knowledge, the University of California in LA developed such scanners about 10 years ago. Could you please comment on this? Yes, so there's uh, a 3D breast CT is commercially available. There is um, at least two companies, uh, one from the US and one from Germany that have commercial systems. Um, and the group at UC, uh, University of California, Davis, uh, directed by John Boone, as also, of course, he's probably one of the earliest uh, developers of RCT. Um, all these, these systems that are commercially available or, or have done a lot of work are three-dimensional systems, so they acquire, um, you know, single images, um, not this uh, four-dimensional aspect. Um, but yes, at least um, two of them are clinically available in Europe, and at least one of them is FDA approved for the US. Um, and I understand that there's quite a few installations in, in for example, China uh, from uh, Koning Corporation, um, and the German company is called uh, ABCT, if I remember correctly. Um, so short answer is the 3D breast CT is commercial available, 4D breast CT uh, doesn't exist in hardware yet. Thank you. And then we have a question from Alessandra Tomo. Mm -hmm. uh, for the polychromatic forward model, did you use two basis material, adipose and glandular tissue? Was the skin is extracted from the glandular information since both glandular and skin had higher attenuation coefficient compared to the adipose tissue? Yes, so um, yes, so the, the skin is represented as a let's say higher density, um, higher uh, glandular tissue, um, higher than 100% glandular tissue, let's say. And our third question from Basilios uh, for the DQCT, how you are improving the noise at the higher voltage CT and also what is the range of the spatial resolution of your image? And what do you think for the co-registration role of MR spectroscopy in addition with REST CT? Um, so the well, okay. So I, I, if I understood the question correctly, so the higher spectrum, uh, higher energy uh, X-ray spectrum, uh, is by inherent physics uh, lower noise because we you get more transmission through the breast. Um, so um, as we know, higher energy you get a higher signal at the detector, but of course you lose contrast, and we compensate for that by um, acquiring the other half, which is the lower energy um, spectrum projections. Um, and it seems to work, the idea that we get good noise characteristics from half the projections and good contrast characteristics from the other half. Um, yes, uh, MRI spectroscopy, um, I guess it could play a role. MRI spectroscopy is, um, I would say, um, more of a point analysis, um, not a you usually at least I'm not an ex MRI expert from, but from all the times I've seen it, is more of a you know one single voxel analysis uh, to get uh, um, a chemical signature, uh, but not um, whole tumor or whole breast analysis of of well, what we hope eventually will become provide information um, of 
molecular um, profile and such. But I can see how it could be used as um, as a validation or for um, yeah as a validation of of these methods. Thank you. And since radiation protection plays an important role in our profession, I have selected here two questions related to the radiation safety. The first one is from Ibrahim Dukhaini, uh, who is asking what is the radiation safety aspect during the five minute scanning and how much dose to the patient would be? And then the second question in this area comes from Ioannis. He says, hi Ioannis. Uh, have you considered the impact of overdiagnosis and or over treatment from increase in resolution spatial and temporal and addition of perfusion imaging in other words is all this extra imaging beneficial to the patient have you shown from critical trials a reduction in mortality from the use of this modality as opposed to the current gold standard um okay so the dose aspects so i i only mentioned at the end so thank you for the question uh, from our um, simulations and our estimates, our, our dose for one full sequence of, of, of 4D breast CT acquisition will be, um, I, 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 well, our results are 15 milligrays, but of course there's still a lot of optimization to go, and that's why I mentioned 15 to 25 milligrays. Now to put that in talk context, one screening view of mammography or let's say tomosynthesis is more uh, closer to one and a half, one to one and a half milligrays. So we are talking uh, 10 times um, a screening uh, acquisition, but, um, and this is uh, a very important, but we are uh, aiming this application, at least an, as a full four dimensional sequence, only for uh, treatment planning and well, everything to, to do after diagnosis. So the woman uh, already has breast cancer. She's not being screened or, or, or um, and, or even diagnosed, she's already been diagnosed with breast cancer via biopsy, and now we want to treat this cancer. And the women that will receive non-adjuvant therapy in which this imaging technology is especially useful in eventually surgery, will eventually receive radiotherapy. And radiotherapy, now we're talking doses in, in, in the levels of grays, as opposed to milligrays. Um, so, Yes, you could argue, and we, we also argue, and that's why we, we're doing uh, everything we're doing to optimize this to, to have a, a, a low dose. Um, but we're, we, we're not concerned with the dose to the level of when we are concerned with the dose at screening um, or even at diagnosis. And especially because this women, after this is done, will eventually get 10, 10 grays of, or, or whatever it is of radiotherapy. So that tissue will, uh, will be exposed to um, a treatment uh, dose that is much, much higher. And the breasts that do not undergo lumpectomy um, and radiotherapy will undergo mastectomy. And therefore the whole tissue that is irradiated with this 15 to 25 milligrays uh, per series will be ex uh, extracted. Uh, so then in, in, that, in that tissue, that dose is no, not concerned at all. And we do have uh, prior uh, simulations showing that the dose to the rest of the body is, is extremely low, even for these somewhat higher X-ray energies. Um, about the other question, uh, no. So um, I think uh, and then it became clear that, you know, we are still at the development stage um, no woman has ever been imaged with 4D breast CT yet because this uh, system doesn't exist yet. Um, and of course, we're not concerned that this will increase over diagnosis or, or any of those controversies of screening because this is, a, uh, as I said, an imaging application will, is post-diagnosis, so it's only um, at treatment. Um, so we're not concerned about that. I think that was part of the, of the question. And um, are we sure we're going to have a, um, well, have we demonstrated a clinical impact? No, well, no, of course not. That is the, the next stage. The first stage is developing the technology. Um, and then once we do the clinical trials, which are part of um, this multi-year project that we are about to start, uh, we will know the actual impact of the, of the system. 
I think that was all. Thank you very much. I checked the chat feed and we also got a thank you from Ioannis who asked actually the last question. So with this, we reached the end of our webinar. Uh, the recording from the webinar will be available online at the IOMT website by the end of the day tomorrow. I would like to thank once again, of course, to the speaker, Dr. Sikopoulos, and to all the participants that have been um, supporting us during this Medical Physics Week. And now I give the stage to John to close this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mag Magdalena. Thank you, Ioannis, for your excellent presentation. And many, many thanks to 500 colleagues who joined for their active participation. Judging, judging from the numerous thank you messages uh, we are receiving, I understand, Ioannis, that participants are most appreciative for this lecture. Very, very engaging presentation. Again, thanks a lot for sharing your knowledge with us. You. So, tomorrow, same time, another webinar on radionuclide therapy patients. Don't miss it. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.